So I think it's fair and reasonable to say that there's a legitimate cause for concern in Gainesville right now. We're going to talk about that here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. I am Brandon Olson. Not happy Monday, but find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with whole nine sports, Giants, country, NFL 33. And these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business that's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown college. Terms and conditions do apply. Um, excuse the raspiness. This is what happens when you yell for three to four hours, uh, however long that game was. But this this is what happens when you're yelling the entirety of the game. Um so, so yeah, that was the, I, before I talk about, it, I will say thank you to everyone that I met in Gainesville. Uh, I feel like every time I come here, it, it's just cooler and cooler. Um, Tyson, it was great meeting you, both big and little Tyson, and everybody that stopped me. Awesome. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. But to the matter at hand, there are. And again, I, I'm not saying that, oh, Billy's on the hot seat. I think most of us acknowledge that Billy Napier is pretty safe through this year and probably through the entirety of next year as well. But there's legitimate cause for concern, I think, as to whether or not Billy Napier is the guy in Gainesville. And again, this is not to say he's on the hot seat because he's not at all right now but it is time to start asking if he's the guy or not and there are some things that you can't change really mid-season can't change your talent can't can't change the talent available can't change your roster mid-season i mean you, you can subtract but that's about it but even then the guys that like last year a lot of the guys that weren't working out were Mullen guys this year good deal of players in general are Billy Napier guys whether it's freshmen that and and by freshmen I mean just players that Billy Napier brought in from high school not necessarily freshmen this year whether it's freshmen that aren't panning out at all or whether it's portal guys who haven't been penning. And and they've hit on some. I know that I saw uh, some guys on and some people on Twitter complaining about like Cam Jackson. I don't think Cam Jackson is a whiff at all. I think Cam Jackson is just a nose tackle. And nose tackles don't make the sexy plays. His job is to literally just eat blocks and two gap it. And then allow players around him to make the plays. That's tough when you don't have the players around you. So there's that, but I think that we can talk about the talent at another time, we can say, because again, that's one of those things you can't fix right now. So I don't think there's a ton of benefit to harping on it too much. And time will tell on the evaluation part there for Billy Napier, and it will also tell on the evaluation and development part here for the high school guys, because portal guys are supposed to be not finished products, but closer to finished products when you bring them up. There are, however, things that Billy Napier can change during the season and hasn't, doesn't, whatever, whatever word you want to use for it, but we see the creative play calls like three or four times a game. I mentioned it on the uh, the, the post-game podcast where 
Eugene Wilson the third motioned into the backfield and then he ran an angle route out of it and got the ball and it was just, it was a great play. It, it was and it was something that Billy Napier and this staff should do more often. But far, far, far too often they're like, hey, let's do the same boring crap we always do. And by boring, I don't mean that it's just not creative. I mean that it's redundant at certain points. Um, the up tempo, just why not? Like I, I understand from Billy Napier's side of things, and uh, I, I think to an extent Rob Sale has, I think he plays a part in this of wanting to control the clock, wanting to control the game, wanting to not let an opposing offense get into a rhythm. Which, by the way, does it matter? At that point, like every time the opposing offense gets on the field, no matter the situation, they tend to have a successful drive. So are you really stopping them at all? No. Um, But when Florida goes up tempo, they've been pretty good. I noticed that against, I, I, I haven't looked at the snap counts or anything, but it felt like against Arkansas, Florida went a bit more 11 personnel. I don't know if that was just, hey, we know that this defense is probably going to play a good bit of man coverage, so we're going to go lighter and try to make some plays happen there. You didn't make many plays happen there. Um, you, it, it just wasn't working out. But there are things that Billy Napier can change midseason, like the creative play calling. And by that, I mean more creative play calling, more up-tempo aggressiveness. And he just doesn't. And that is, is an incredibly frustrating part because, again, talent, you can't change. Like, once you start the year, that's the talent you have. But there are coaching tendencies and coaching habits that you can change and you can fix during the season, and they haven't. And I, I get it if you want to go, oh, Billy Napier is going to make his changes in the offseason. That's fine and dandy. Um, except for the fact that it's not because it's the same crap that keeps being your Achilles heel. It's your special teams not working. It's a, a constant miscommunication at the start of the year is that the defense was getting the calls in too late. And I don't know if it was on the TV copy there, but I know that I watched Graham Mertz call the second time out of the second half and then walk to the sideline and i don't know what he was yelling but i know that i saw him doing this which and and, and if you're listening and not watching now I'm, I'm rolling my hand forward which is, is universal for hurry the hell up okay that's what that means that means hurry the hell up and it was clear that Graham Mertz was frustrated with that. Graham looked like he was frustrated on the spike uh, field goal, whatever that was, which I get it. Five yards is not a, a huge difference when, when the issue was kicking it wide left or wide right, especially when it looked like the wind took it. Isn't that even a better argument, though, for why those five yards mattered? Because it wasn't a wide, like it, like it was a wide miss, but it wasn't like a bad miss. And had you had those five yards, maybe it goes in. Just saying. But again, there are these constant issues that at least should make you question whether Billy Napier is the guy. And I don't mean talent. Like, you can take talent out of the equation. You can take it completely out of the equation. Because when you look at the teams that have beaten Florida this year, it's Utah, it's Georgia, it's Kentucky, it's Arkansas. Georgia is probably the only team in that bunch where you can look at them and just say, they've got the all-around, definitively more talented roster. Arkansas, Kentucky are not putting together these powerhouse programs. And they kick the crap out of Florida, like physically on the field. They kick the crap out of Florida. Utah, 
hell of a coach team. They've got some great players, but I, I'm I don't think that they're a top five team in the country like like Georgia is. And it's like, I don't get it. Like, you could take talent out of the equation, and you could just say that Billy Napier has made coaching decisions that are what we in the biz call bad too often. Just too often. Uh, and one of the coaching decisions that he made was to hire Austin Armstrong, and I'm not saying that that was a bad decision. However, the defense has not looked great this year. We are about to talk about that. Before we talk about that, it is time for your Game Changer of the Week, brought to you by the Athletic Brewing Company, Florida Gators Game Changer of the Week. Yeah, it has to be Eugene Wilson the third, right? Two touchdowns. I get it. They were early touchdowns, then he kind of went ghost, and then he made a couple plays late. It has to be Eugene Wilson the third. Those two touchdowns were huge, especially because Arkansas started up 14-0 very quickly. Very quickly. And Trey just made play after play to get the team back into this. And just like Athletic Brewing Company, they've changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. You can find Athletic Brewing Co.'s non-alcoholic brews at a store near you or buy online at athleticbrewing.com. First-time customers can use code Locked On to get 15% off your first online order. That's code Locked On at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company is fit for all times. And like I mentioned, we're, we're talking about this defense now. Thank you for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. But it is absolutely incredible, just incredible to watch this defense get torched week in and week out. It's honestly kind of impressive how consistent they are with that. And I understand that injuries in this game specifically were a factor. You look at Shamar James ruled out for the season on Wednesday. That sucked. Cam Jackson, Tyreek Sapp, both listed as questionable before the game. Or, well, both listed as questionable on the depth chart on Wednesday. Ruled out slightly before the game. During the game, Jack Pyburn, who was starting for Tyreek Sapp, got hurt. So I understand that, yes, injuries played a part in this game. However, this is not a one-time event. This is a defense that I feel like for the most part has remained relatively consistent. I feel like a lot of the injury issues have been on offense. Uh, Kingsley Aguakin, you had Austin Barber missed a game. You've had basically everybody under the sun hurt at one time or another on offense on defense you have remained relatively healthy they've just underperformed at every possible turn there are a couple of guys who make plays pretty consistently but for the most part this entire defense has underperformed but the things that drive me crazy is that a a good coach makes adjustments that like that's scripted plays is something I've talked about with Billy Napier. Where oh, like you look at the first drive, they're usually pretty damn good. Um, I'm not gonna harp too much on Florida's first drive against Arkansas because there's a first play fumble. Um, but generally, good coaches make adjustments, and Austin Armstrong a few times this year has not made the necessary adjustments or has not really fixed any issues during the game. You go back to the Kentucky game. Actually, let's, let's go back to Utah. Let's go back to Utah week one. Uh, Johnson came in for Utah at quarterback and QB run game worked with no problem. No problem. There was that touchdown run, multiple conversions, QB run game worked with no problem. Then you go to Charlotte. We can look at the Charlotte game, and Charlotte found success with the QB run game. 
Okay. You look at the Kentucky game. Kentucky wasn't QB run, but it was just those gap runs that they just kicked the absolute crap out of Florida with. And there weren't really adjustments made defensively. Then you look at this game against Arkansas and KJ Jefferson, the QB run game again, just dominated this defense. And it wasn't just QB draw. There was, I believe we saw uh, power a couple times. And if I'm not mistaken, once or twice, we saw QB counter, which is a fun one, by the way. Um, That is a very fun play. I mean, before he was ruled out for the season, Anthony Richardson with the Indianapolis Colts was making some great plays there. Um, obviously, I know that you know Anthony Richardson is an Indianapolis Colt. I just mean that specifically this year with the Colts, they were running QB counter, and it was working beautifully. But this defense just made no adjustments to account for that. And I mean that schematically and just what the actual defenders did. There were quite a few times where we would see defenders sprint into KJ Jefferson and just collide with him. I don't want to say hit him. I want to say collide with him. And they made no adjustments, and it almost never worked. Whether it was in the backfield, at, like whether he was like trying to throw the ball and it was in the pocket, or if he was trying to run the ball, they just ran in and collided with him. And I don't know if you know this. KJ Jefferson is a pretty big dude. Like, KJ Jefferson is build wise very similar to a a cam newton where he's just an absolute unit and you need to make a smart play you can hit him but wrap up when you do take him down and this defense just has not been able to put it together you look at the pass rush five sacks against arkansas uh, two two turnovers against Arkansas, and you still gave up 500 yards to a team with a first time play caller and a, a, an interim offensive coordinator at the helm. That like there's there's just no excusing that, and I I understand that there are certain elements of well we don't know what they were going to do offensively because of the offensive coordinator change there's only so much they could have installed in their bye week you couldn't install a whole new system they were running the same system prepare for that i think everybody that ever watched an arkansas game this season or last season would tell you hey that kj jefferson fella might want to watch it if he wants to take off running. And Florida just had no answer for it. Consistently. And again, the deep shot and the explosive plays destroyed Florida's defense. It was rough. Like, there's just no other way. And, like, I know that there's a lot of people that complain about referees and stuff like that. Here's the thing. They sucked on both sides. They miss calls on both sides. It's really hard for me. Like, I, I can say, hey, yeah, the referees sucked. Referees did not lose this game for the Florida Gators. Let's get that really clear. When you want to say, oh, who lost this game for the Florida Gators? It's the coaching staff. It is. Just It's plain and simple. It's the coaching staff lost this game for the Florida Gators. The coaching staff lost to two and six at the time. Arkansas, and I understand they're the best two and six team in the country. You still should have won that game. You're in Gainesville. Uh, you you should have won that game, not handedly, but you should have won that game. And now you have to consider what the rest of the season looks like for you, because yikes. And we need to have that conversation before we have that conversation. These days, every new potential hire can be like a high stakes wager for your small business. And you want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. 
That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free, whether you're looking for a game changer coordinator or if you're trying to hire an offensive coordinator. Just saying, Billy. Just saying. Add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring with simple tools like screening questions. It makes it easier for you to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. And it's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires for leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Thanks again for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free. We're in the podcast. To wrap up today's show, we have to talk about the rest of the season. Um, and this is a conversation that if you are someone that uh, I ran into in Gainesville at any point, we probably had this conversation because it was a very prevalent question, which was, what do you think about the Arkansas game prior to the game? And my thought was, it's a must-win game. And they didn't win it. And that sucks. And it wasn't a must-win game because you were playing against 2-6 and six Arkansas. It wasn't a must-win game because I was there and I was not trying to watch a loss. It wasn't a must-win game for any other reason other than this was your easiest game in the second half of your schedule. Okay? This was the one that you were supposed... And then now you could argue it's LSU depending on Jaden Daniels' status because he left Saturday night's game early with a concussion. Um or he entered concussion protocol and was immediately ruled out. So assuming he is indeed concussed. So you can argue that if he can't go, maybe LSU is the easiest game in your second half of the schedule. Maybe you can go into Death Valley and win this game. Um, either way, I don't care because that does not change the fact that our, the Arkansas game was a must win. If you get bailed out, I don't care. You still had a must win game and you went and lost it. And the main reason that the Arkansas game, to me, was must win is because Arkansas, again, they were 2-6. and six. They were a good 2-6. and six. They were a team that they took Bama to the wire. They took LSU to the wire. So they were a good team. Record did not indicate that. But even though they were a good team, they were your easiest matchup for the rest of the season. They came into your house... And they beat you. So for me, the issue is that you let Arkansas come into your house and beat you. I can't realistically look at anybody and say, yeah, Arkansas beat you on your own home turf. But you can go into Death Valley and beat LSU. Yeah, Arkansas beat you on your own home turf. You can go into Missouri and beat Mizzou. Both of those teams are top 15. And then you wrap up the season with Florida State, which, I mean, that's three weeks out, so it's impossible to project injuries. But Johnny Wilson, Keon Coleman dealing with injuries. We'll see how they are. But here's the thing. I don't like having to sit here and talk about the Florida Gators and, and their rest of the season and go, well, if the opposing team's missing their star player or star players, you got a shot. Because that sucks, right? You don't want to be in that spot. But again, losing this Arkansas game, it was must win for me. And, and I can't watch that game, watch how awful the Florida Gators were at some points. I will die on the hill. Like, I don't know why Billy Napier needs to be trailing in order for his offense to open up uh, even a little bit. But it was must win for me for that reason, that that you lost that game on your own home turf. I just can't 
realistically, and I, I can optimistically say things, but I can't realistically look at the rest of the schedule and go, there's a win there. So you went from five and two at the bye to trending towards five and seven this season. And again, I, I think that a lot of Florida Gators fans, myself even included, think, oh, I think you can maybe squeak one out at some point in these last three games. And maybe, but again, realistically, you are not going to. You might, but realistically, you're not going to. That's just not, that shouldn't be the expectation. This was the last game on the schedule that you were expected to win. And now you're fighting for bowl eligibility and you're going to be scraping and clawing for bowl eligibility. And the especially crappy part about that, when we even talk long-term program building status is next year, the Florida Gators have the most difficult schedule I have ever seen. If you don't make a bowl game this year, and then you've got to run that gauntlet next year. There is a real chance that you don't make a bowl game next year. And my concern is that whether or not Billy is the guy, I don't know if you can not make a bowl game in your second and third years after making one in your first year, albeit with an easier schedule in your first year. But I don't know if you can make a bowl game and then miss bowl games back to back and keep your job. Not saying that I would fire him. That's not a thing that I really consider like that, but just saying it's a realistic possibility that people should probably think about, probably consider and acknowledge a little bit. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free reviews in the podcast. We'll be back tomorrow. Talk more Florida Gators football talk about the rest of the season, talk about maybe some changes, maybe some fixes for Lockdown Gators. I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with whole nine sports, Giants country, NFL 33. And as always, I will see you all tomorrow.